Hello and welcome to HistFest 2021, coming live from living rooms around the country. Um, my name is Rebecca Adil and I'm the director of HistFest and I'm so excited to share this weekend's events with you. Please do check out everything else that's going on via the website www.histfest.org. Um, also, please do use the hashtag HistFest2021 if you're sharing thoughts and opinions on um, social media. Before we get started, I just want to run through some housekeeping using the menu of above you can provide feedback to the event um, and if you wish also donate to the the British Library. The library is a charity um, and your support really does help um, open up a world of knowledge and inspiration to everyone. Um, the, there will be a short audience Q&A at the end of the discussion. If you'd like to submit questions for the speakers please do so using the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Um, captions and um, sign language are are available during this talk as well. You can enable captions using a, the option at the bottom of the screen, or we're going to post a link in the chat so that you can view the captions in the browser. You can also pin Gabby, well, not literally, but um, the <laughs> sign language interpreter so that you can see um, that more clearly as well. Now, without further ado, I'm truly delighted to introduce our first event of the festival, Disability in the Industrial Revolution, Pitmen, Politicians, Activists and Artists. A discussion with leading scholar of disability history and author of Disability in the 18th Century, sorry, in 18th Century England, Imagining Physical Impairment, Dr. David Turner, and historian, award-winning disability rights activist and campaigner, Dr. Amy Kavanagh. Over to you. Hello, everybody. It's lovely to be here. Very excited to be at His Fest. Um, I'm Dr. Amy Kavanagh. And with me is Dr. David Turner. Hello. Um, and we're going to talk about disability history today. Um, I'm going to leap right in with my questions, if that's all right with you, David. Yeah, by the way. <laughs> so, disability history um, is kind of still treated as, as new territory in uh, exploring the past. Can you reflect, David, on kind of why historians are slow to explore disability as a category of history? Um, and why is it an important experience that we need to be including in our stories about the past? Yeah, it's a good starting points, really. Um, why are disabled people excluded from the histories that we write? Well, I suppose there's lots of reasons for that. One is that there's an assumption that disabled people are too marginalised to be important or uh, that the only disabled people who matter are uh, people who somehow overcome their impairments and achieved something against the odds. Um, I think there's also a view perhaps that there aren't enough sources to study uh, disabled people um, in the past and that uh, disabled people's experience is always hidden from history. But, um, but that's just not true, really. I mean, I think um, when you start looking at sources, when you start to look for disability in a wide variety of historical texts and images, then you find that disabled people are absolutely everywhere, uh, even though they are outside of um, the, the kind of mainstream histories that we write. And it's really important to include disabled people in our understanding of the past because, um, because disability is part of everyone's experience, really. I mean, you might be, you might consider yourself disabled now, but if, if you don't, then the chances are that you know somebody in your in your family who's disabled. That you, uh, um, that, that and that's uh, if you live long enough, you'll become disabled. So, so disability history is the history of all of us. Absolutely. I think it's important to uh, to reflect on the fact that, you know, before modern medicine, in the type of work that people did, in the prevalence of, of warfare, there were many reasons to acquire disability or to exist as a disabled person in the past. What I found really interesting about your, your book, David, is that you talk about the fact that there's been an assumption that disabled people um, 
were not part of industrialization and that there was this shift from disabled people being able to work and be productive in in the home but as soon as a more industrial and modern society came along um the disabled people stopped being part of the picture and the only histories we get around disability traditionally have been about institutions um i wondered if you could kind of reflect a little bit on that yeah um yeah, i mean you're absolutely right there's a there has it been this sort of um, image of the of the industrial revolution as as being like a moment where it all goes wrong for disabled people so before industrialization um people work predominantly in the home um or close to home and uh, this ena supposedly enabled people to be more integrated into social and economic life but then industrialization which is which is often seen in a very narrow way as sort of uh, the, the rise of the factories, but of course, industrialization is a much wider process than that, a more complicated process than that. Industrialization comes along, uh, people are expected to work faster, to, to produce goods to a certain standard. Um, they're subject to greater discipline about when they start and finish work uh, in the day. And so this, um, this has been argued sort of pushes disabled people out of the workplace and uh, where do they end up? Well, the view is that they tend to be uh, segregated in institutions, in asylums, in workhouses, uh, and so on. There's a certain truth to that, but it's by no means the whole of the picture. And what I was really surprised to find in uh, when, when I was looking at uh, the history of disability in the coal industry, which is absolutely crucial to Britain's industrial development in the 19th and 20th centuries, um, is that disabled people are, are absolutely everywhere. Um, they are working in coal mines, uh, they're working on the surface, they are um, visible members of coal field communities, and they're, they're there in other industrial uh, societies as well. Um, so visitors to the large um, textile manufacturing towns and cities in, in the north of England uh, in the uh, 1830s and 40s, for example, are really struck by the, 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 the number of disabled people that they're encountering on, on the street. So, so rather than disability being um, segregated or sort of hidden away from society in the 19th century, what you actually see is something very different actually of disability being absolutely everywhere in industrial society. And people commenting on that and reflecting on that as a way of thinking about the bigger changes that are going on in Britain and other um, European countries at this time. It's an interesting parallel, isn't it? Because as an activist over the last year, one of the things that the disability community have been pointing out is that working from home is actually very accessible for a lot of disabled people. And that many disabled people in the workplace have asked to work from home and been denied that, being told, oh, that's not possible, we can't achieve that. And then the pandemic happens and within two weeks everything's online. So it's interesting to reflect on that dichotomy about what is achievable and where, where work takes place. You know, it's quite a historical conversation, actually. Now we've been using the word um, disability. And in my work as a disability activist, I talk a lot about something called the social model of disability. So this is the idea that disability is created by social and physical barriers rather than impairments. For example, a wheelchair user is disabled by a lack of ramps instead of stairs, not because they use a wheelchair. So in your work, have you found that there are historically different ideas about disability, what it means, and there, are there any comparisons with our modern concepts, including an idea like the social model? Yeah, um, I mean, ideas about disability change over time, you know, so understandings of disability don't stay the same. They, they, they change, they, they, are, they are shaped by the different historical contexts in which uh, 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 disabled people live. So, so the, the social model of disability um, is something that 
emerges uh, through the disability rights movement in quite recent times in uh, the 1970s is when, when, when we, we start to see that idea really being uh, expressed and uh, conceptualized. Um, that was itself was a reaction to uh, the medical model of disability, um, which um, takes a very different view that, uh, that the problem of disability resides in the individual rather than in the wider society. So uh, you are disabled because you can't do certain kinds of things rather than because of the way society is configured. And the medical model itself is the, is the, pro is, uh, the product of certain historical processes. And the medical model isn't constant throughout history as well. I would say it's something that's, that starts to take shape really at, so in the late 19th century, but particularly after the First World War. Um, and it's linked to, to certain medical developments like orthopedics. Now, when you go further back into time, which is uh, what I'm more interested in, uh, when we look at the 18th century and uh, the 19th century, then these kind of modern cat uh, concepts like the social model and the medical model are very difficult to apply um, to, to the experiences of people living at that time. And it's difficult to find um, sources that kind of fit into these kinds of modern ways of thinking about disability. But one thing that's really interesting is that the idea of disability as something which is shaped by social and cultural factors, which is a really important principle of the, of the social model of disability, that isn't entirely new to, um, to the late 20th century. So you do find people in the uh, 19th century talking about disability in those terms. And um, I've been working on a project recently with um, my colleague, Daniel Blackie, who I think is in the audience uh, to this event. So uh, shout out to Dan, if you're there. Um, but, but Dan and I have been, uh, are interested in um, so the, the history, early history of disabled people's political activism. And so we found some writers um, in the early 1840s, sort of talking about disability in those kinds of terms as, as, as being a problem that isn't just a, an individual misfortune, but uh, it's created because of the way in which society treats people um, who are uh, physically different. So one of the writers uh, we, we're, we're interested in is a man called William Dodd, who um, was employed by uh, factory reformers to go on a tour of northern England. And Dodd himself had worked in a factory and uh, he had lost his arm um, as a result of an accident and so he wasn't able to work anymore in, 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 the, in the textile factory but he was employed by uh, Lord Ashley who is the, um, the, the, the key philanthropist behind um, uh, factory reform to go on this tour around northern England and uh, the aim was to try and get, get some evidence of how bad things were in factories. But Dodd went a bit further than that. He actually sought out fellow disabled people and started to gather their experiences. And he, he records these you know, hundreds, you know, hundreds of interviews that he does with, uh, with disabled um, workers. And, he, and he, he starts to kind of think about, well, you know, that their, their problems sort of, um, you know, they, they lie beyond simple questions of, um, working conditions in factories. It's about sort of compensation. It's about how, uh, how these people are looked after after the accident, how they are um, cared for by their communities, what role their employers continue to take in terms of taking responsibility for the accidents that have befallen them. Um, and so, you know, he talks about a lot about compensation as being a really important issue for disabled um, industrial workers. And, you know, uh, he, he says, at one point, we demand something better than mm. the kind of um, you know, than the, the, the um, other kinds of welfare um, that, that was available for for those workers. So, so it's really fascinating to find early examples of activists um, presenting disability in those kind of uh, social, cultural, and economic terms, not just um, subscribing to the view that disability is an individual misfortune is you know these are people these are people of their time and they see disability quite differently to a modern social model but they're start but they, they, they but they're thinking in those kinds 
of terms, even if they don't express it in the way that modern activists have done. It's interesting to hear about that kind of community building because that's something I'm very familiar with. You know, as someone that was born disabled but became, you know, kind of more aware of disability activism later in life. You know, Twitter was my version of Dodds going around, you know, chatting to everybody. It was that kind of discovering, oh my goodness, there's there's a whole community out here of people with different experiences. So it's quite kind of heartening to see that experience reflected in the past. So you're saying that, you know, that, um, you know, we don't talk about disability in the same way as it was maybe referred to historically. This was something I found really interesting because again, in my own work, a lot of people say, well, I'm very worried about words, like what words should I use when I describe a disabled person or how do disabled people refer to themselves? Um, quite often people use um, euphemisms like differently abled or other kind of cringeworthy uh, characteristics like that. Um, there's lots of different types of language in your book and, and in your work about how people were described with long-term conditions, injuries and disabilities. Can you sort of reflect on some of those those words and the language and what, what they meant and how they referred to people? Yeah, I mean, the language um, of disability is, is complex, you know, historically. But, um, on one hand, it's very blunt, and people in the past use words that we today find offensive. Um, so, you know, <laughs> you know, well, you know, common words to describe someone with physical impairment, for example, would be to, to, to call them a cripple or to describe them as lame. And, they, you know, those are, um, those, those are seen nowadays as very negative uh, uh, terms, um, you know, particularly when they're used by people outside of the uh, disability community um so you know you know uh, so that's a, maybe reflects a kind of um a sort of lack of embarrassment maybe about sort of about, uh, talk about disability in very kind of um you know direct terms I, I suppose um that there wasn't a sort of sense of offense around certain words in the past that we um have today um and you know, these are these. You know, the, the term like cripple is quite an objectifying term. It's sort of um, it's bound up with ideas of you know of kind of incapacity, but also pity. Uh, to, um, but but also disabled people are using those terms themselves to, to describe um, themselves. So going back to William Dodd, who I was talking about a moment ago, he he calls himself the factory cripple, and he kind of. He always re reclaims that term in the way that um, disabled people re have reclaim the term "crip" today as a um, as, as a more positive uh, identity term. So, you know, th there is a kind of um, you know, so, so, so you know, we shouldn't assume that this language is simply used to by non-disabled people to describe mm -hmm. disabled people. Disabled people are using those terms themselves. In terms of the word "disabled." Um, then th this is a word that's used uh, particularly just to describe someone who is unable to do paid work and I emphasize paid work because um, disabled people in the past like they do today or uh, do a lot of unpaid work and uh, uh, emotional labor and care work as well but but in the past people are very, very they can say about paid work and so and, and in the Victorian periods uh, this term disabled can be used either to describe someone who's disabled from doing their normal kinds of work. Um, so, you know, a coal miner who's um, injured in an accident, who's not able to go back to cutting coal, but they're not, let's say, incapacitated from doing anything at all. Or it can also refer to, to total disability. So um, that someone is incapacitated from any kinds of work altogether. And then you get words which, aren't sort of obvious disability words um, so and some of these are closely linked to occupation and class so one of the um, terms that we see quite a lot in industrial contexts in the 19th century is the term worn out somebody being uh, it, it sort of imagines the body like a machine um, so you do, you know, so, so you're worked until you're unable to 
um, to, 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 to work anymore. So you're worn out like a part of the machinery. And this is a very powerful way of uh, conceptualizing the role of the worker in this new uh, um, capitalist industrial economy. Um, and people also often conceptualize disability in terms of premature aging as well. And this is closely linked to the idea of being worn out. So, um, so you get a lot of commentary about workers in particular industries being worn out um, at younger ages. So, you know, coal miners, for example, are, are seen as sort of in their at their peak in their 20s, but by the age of 30, they're starting to succumb to chronic diseases, particularly in coal fields like Scotland, where the um, where, where the coal is very dusty and this causes a lot of lung diseases. Uh, by the by, forty, um, you know, um, commentators are saying well, miners are largely disabled by the age of forty. Some are carrying on in you know in mine work, but you know, in much fewer numbers. And then by fifty, you know, that they are. Um, at the end of their working lives, at least as far as working in a, in a mines concerned. So, so the idea of, of, of industrial works is speeding up people's life cycles, making them yet old before their time, is a really powerful theme in a lot of writing um, from that period. It's really interesting, isn't it? Because I, I found the use of the word kind of worn out. It is really powerful. Like you say, somebody's like part of a machine, but also the way that that was associated with what became called the rest. So where if you were considered perhaps temporarily disabled or having a condition that was temporarily, um, you know, taking away your capacity to work, you could you could go for the rest and then it was kind of a ratio between how worn out you were and how capable you were of recovering and these ideas it's almost like they're you know being sent off to recharge their batteries or how you know tune up the engine which is a really interesting um kind of reflection on how there is that understanding that people can um recover or people can find different function or find different capacity and it's it's reassuring to it for a disabled person, you know, of the 21st century to see disability understood in a slightly more flexible way, because as a blind person, um, you know, people see a white cane or a guide dog and they assume it's a binary, you know, you can either see nothing or you can see completely fine. And it's, it's that's kind of that understanding of those gray areas of experience seems so much more present in the 19th century because I suppose they're a lot more common. People, you know, went through illness and impairment. And really that leads on to kind of the next area I want to reflect on, which is what I really enjoyed about the book is how it demonstrated that, you know, disability didn't necessarily mean exclusion from the workplace. And that actually there were very specific roles for disabled people um, that became sort of carved out as a space for disabled people being able to access work. Could you tell us a little bit more about those, David? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, just going back to your previous point, I mean, there is a real expectation that you will work as long as you're able to, as you know, it, um, that, that um, this has appeared before old age retirement, for example. So people are really sort of expected to get to get to try and get back into work after um, serious injury, for example, even if that left them impaired in in uh, in some way. So, um, so so we do find cases in, um, in coal mining of um, men with with wooden legs uh, working underground. Um, sometimes they are um, helped by others. Um, so in uh, parts of South Wales, uh, for example, um, coal miners continue to work in family groups um, through much of the 19th century. And so having your family around you might, might be quite helpful if you're, um, if you're uh, a disabled person. Um, and sometimes you actually have um, disabled miners employing others almost as, as, as personal assistants actually underground. So um, there's a, um, in, in 1842, there's a big um, government investigation into 
uh, and to the importance of children in coal mines, which reveals all this kind of extent of uh, uh, disabled people's working uh, in, in, in this, this industry. So in Pembrokeshire, where um, women and girls are still working underground in the um, early 19th century, there's one old miner who's employed his neighbor's daughter to go underground with him to help him to, uh, to cut coal because, because he's, got to, he's lost his leg and he can't work as, as well as he, he used to. Um, so, so you do find disabled people under working underground, just going back to the same kind of work that they used to do. But of course, not everybody is able to do that. And so um, you also find uh, work being found for uh, disabled miners on the surface. Uh, so there's a very wide range of jobs at the 19th century coal mine. It's quite an occupationally diverse industry mining. And that sort of enables people to uh, participate in certain roles. Um, example um, in um, tending the lamps that miners use uh, sometimes you have cases of uh, disabled miners uh, the employers knock us up so these are people who go around uh, waking people up in the morning uh, most popular job I'm sure in the 19th century mining village <laughs> um, and and um, you, know, you know so so these people so men are able to kind of continue to work and I think in terms of uh, this idea of the, the male breadwinner, this is very important, although some of this work is lower status. So another important thing about mining is that the, there's all kinds of work, but it's very hierarchical. And so if you're able to go back to cutting coal, then you're at the top of the um, working hierarchy. But if you go back to working in the lamp room, for example, that's boys' work, mm. what younger, uh, inexperienced workers do. So to be a sort of you know, middle-aged miner going to, to that kind of work could be um, demeaning, even though it, it, it enables him to continue in work. And you find people going back, get, and disabled miners sometimes go into work in, in their local communities, doing other work. And one thing that's really interesting is the number of disabled workers um, who find jobs in teaching in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Um, so uh, village schools are kind of um, have some disabled workers teaching uh, children. Um, there are quite a lot of disabled children in the class, actually, because education might be um, a way of some sort of training for a different kind of work. Um, so, so, so you know, and this is quite an important role in a in a in a in a, in a working class community. It carries a lot of status, but it's increasingly challenged as time goes on because education becomes more professionalized. As the 19th century wears on, and so these um, the, these these men who kind of drift into teaching because they're disabled from other kinds of work eventually get pushed out of education as uh, more emphasis on uh, on on, um, on, uh, on on formally educated uh, people going into the teaching profession. It's interesting about the fact that in the book you talk about you know disabled men having to do boys work and that classic image for most of us that know a, a tiny bit or have been to a local museum about mining is that image of the small child in the dark opening a door but actually in quite a few cases it was going to be a disabled older man potentially doing that job as well which sort of leads on to my next area that I wanted to chat about which is about how disabled people were kind of used, included and excluded from protest movements and particularly kind of early ideas of what we would now consider like a union. So for me, as someone that spends a lot of time on social media, I often see disabled people being co-opted to um, to forward a particular argument or to counteract a particular argument a particular and actually quite a, a good comparison at the moment is around environmentalism and how disabled people are simultaneously excluded by some things like banning plastic straws or then utilized to say that we should keep uh, cars on the street instead of, of bikes um, and I found it really interesting how disabled miners in particular had that similar experience you know they sort of became almost like poster cripples of certain movements that either they would be representing 
um, destitution and you know the hard labor or they would sometimes be used as as um, strike breakers to then actually kind of get more work and I thought that was a really interesting kind of juxtaposition um, so can you uh, explore a little bit more of that for us yeah so um yeah this idea of the post equipper is really interesting I think and uh, um you know disabled people are used and exploited in various campaigns uh, today and that, that's the case in the past as well so um so by the time we get to the mid 19th century where trade unions are becoming um established um disability is being used um to, to encourage people to sign up and join a union because um you know uh, so, so trade unions use statistics about the high rates of disablement in uh, industries like mining uh, as as the, the reason why men need to, to join the union because actually because uh, it's by 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 coming together with others um that they can fight for the uh for the cause of uh, better um compensation and, and care um, uh, um uh, when 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 disablement inevitably comes because that's you know it's a firm sense of it you know that you will become disabled if you're if you're working in this very dangerous industry. So so yeah, the, the, um, and then unions sort of exploit images of suffering mm. of uh, disabled uh, people um, in their propaganda. So this is particularly uh, um, evident in the 1840s in the northeast coal field, which is one of the areas that uh, we looked at in this project, and. Um, in the 18, in the 1840s, a string of really um, um, sort of uh, nasty sort of industrial relations, uh, really, poor, really poor industrial relations between miners and their employers, and acrimonious disputes. Um, so there's a big strike in 1844, for example, and and during that strike, um, one of the tactics that employers used to try and break the morale of strikers was to evict them from their homes because a lot of coal miners lived in uh, accommodation that was owned by their employer. And so that gave employers quite a lot of power over workers. And, um, and so, um, so evictions do take place during these particularly um, long lasting and acrimonious disputes like the one in 1844, and we have other examples um, as well. And um, so the unions sort of pick up on on the, the eviction of older people and of disabled mm. people um, when they're, they're, they're talking about this because it shows in, in the eyes of the unions this is this really shows the, the callousness of the employers that they um, they aren't just evicting healthy um, young miners who are campaigning for better pay but they are, they're also evicting um, disabled people throwing them out on the streets as a very vivid image um, from the Illustrated London News in the mid 19th century of uh, miners camped on the side of a road and one of them's a, a disabled man and uh, you know it's, it's very powerfully evokes the kind of hardship that strikers faced. Um, so so these kinds of images um, really kind of uh, powerful and are very kind of useful for unions in trying to garner sympathy for their cause and it, 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 it appeals to people's sense of fairness and of a kind of Christian duty of charity towards disabled people and so um, so, so these images are uh, exploited to a certain extent in those kinds of disputes and, and yeah and, um, and when, really when are you, there are a lot of modern parallels with that yeah you know, even if you think about the way that images of of you know charity drives now the way the images of disabled children say for example are used to encourage you know donations and or you know to to speak for an issue it's a it's a really interesting current that runs through our history and culture that when you want to show suffering or in you know indifference or inequality that an image of a disabled person seems to be the one that you'll go to so I think the next question I'm just going to ask um, to sort of draw our chat to a close um, and people can put questions in 
the chat and through the Q&A. But, you know, at the start of our discussion, David, we did we reflected on, you know, disability history still being quite an under-researched topic. And certainly for me, you know, I, I, I call myself a lapsed historian. So I used to be a historian and I left academia. And as I've been, you know, fairly public about, it is because I found it very inaccessible and I encountered a lot of academic ableism as a disabled uh, historian. And more broadly, you know, that I think there are certainly factors that we can reflect on around, you know, why isn't there enough disability history? And not just from professional historians, but for the general public as well. And kind of what, what barriers are there and what solutions do you think there are to those barriers? Yeah, I mean, we could, we could talk for another hour about this, Amy, I'm sure, because, uh, you know, there are so many um barriers we still need to to challenge really i think um well you know there, there are um I, I think i think one of the things is is about sort of making just just raising awareness of this kind of history i talked at the beginning about some of the perceptions that people have about disabled people really not having a history or um or only kind of exceptional disabled people having a history um and I think we need to, to challenge those kinds of assumptions. So, so it's fantastic that HISTFEST is starting off with an event on disability history and uh, that so many people are here because it, you know, it shows this is important and it's uh, hopefully it'll inspire people to uh, go and, and find out more. Um, but it does mean that, that we need to kind of be, um, be clearer really about what kind of resources there are to study disability history we need to make it more visible in um, not just in, in public history on uh, you know uh, on TV on radio and so on but on the internet but also make it visible in terms of how people access it how people can go off and do their own research and how, how you actually find disability in the archive so I said earlier that disability is everywhere but it's not but but often but m m most interesting things about disabled people's experiences I found it as a researcher, have come from sources which aren't obviously mm. about disability. Um, so, you know, um, a lot of the things I've been talking today, but I've been in parliamentary reports and, um, you know, and newspapers and things like that. So, so we need to kind of uh, create tools for people to be able to, to access resources in archives. And so we need to, we need to make, um, we'd have more, more, more finding guides available. And, and we need to make archives, um, museums more, accommodating places uh, as places where disabled people see their history being represented uh, in um, you know making that that just more, more visible more accessible more welcoming and um, you know that those are just some starting points yeah. but I think yeah there's a whole lot more as you know we do need to make public history more accessible and more welcoming and especially heritage sites which you know by their very nature are often very physically inaccessible but for me there are so many simple solutions that just you know if there are any heritage professionals uh, listening please do uh you know get in touch because i think you know the, the the experiences i've had compared to somewhere like the mary rose museum where as a blind person i could actually touch the ropes that were on the Mary Rose. And then I go to Churchill's house and the touch tour allows me to uh, fondle a mid 20th century fish cabinet, which as I'm sure you can imagine was a square um, and not particularly interesting to feel. And I didn't really get much information from it. Um, so I think it's, uh, it's really important to reflect on how we can bring disability history to the wider public, but also to more disabled people. And that's why virtual events like this are so fantastic because I'm here in my slippers and it's nice and accessible to me and hopefully it's been uh, accessible to other people too. So I think now Rebecca's going to join us and we're going to go to the Q&A. Hello, hello. Hopefully you can see me. Um, that was such an illuminating discussion. Thank you, both of you, for that. And um, thank you, Amy, for being so generous with your and um, sharing your experiences as well. And um, we've got lots of questions. Um, so the first one that I'm going to ask you has 
um, popped up from a couple of people. And it's about the intersection between disability history and women, particularly because, as one of the question um, askers has asked, women have lots of um, chronic illnesses that have not been focused upon enough in, in the past. Um, so I wonder if there's anything to say about that. Um, yeah, there's, I mean, that's a really good point, and I'm glad someone's raised that because, um, you know, I, I've been talking about coal mining here, which is a very uh, masculine industry, although not, although not exclusively. I mean, uh, women are, so are, are employed in coal mines uh, in some parts of the country until 1842. Um, so, but it's certainly true that women's uh, experiences um, have been marginalised in, you know, in disability history. and. Yeah, there, there are many reasons for that. Um, one is going back to something I said um, earlier on uh, about how the idea of, dis of, of being disabled or disabilities is it's so often related to, to to paid work, which is traditionally a kind of masculine sphere, and so um, and, and so women's experiences are, are less visible there. Um, so. And yeah, and I think there's you know a, t a tendency to, um, as the questioners have said, you know that, that chronic illnesses aren't taken as seriously, perhaps as um, as other kinds of impairment. So there is, I think, throughout history there have been sort of hierarchies of uh, of disability and different degrees of visibility. And you know the classic example being the um, the the, the um, amputee soldier or sailor who is a very conspicuous figure and is um, you know the, the focus of all kinds of patriotic imagery um, and uh, quite positive uh, portrayals of, of disability whereas um, uh, you know a cro whereas chronic illness you know is, is, is invisible and it tends to you know and, and um, you know we, um, with, you know, things, things like chronic pain, women are, are today still far less likely to be taken seriously by doctors when they talk about chronic pain or to, uh, far less likely to, to kind of be offered um, medication than, than, than men are. So, so there's this kind of, all, so, so a whole variety of factors really serve to marginalise um, disabled women's experiences. So I think, you know, as we sort of try and open up disability history, um, looking at, uh, you know, we need to, to Pay more attention to the experiences of women, the experiences of people of colour, and uh, and others who are marginalised within disability history. I think it's oh. worth uh, tooting David's horn a little bit because he does have a whole chapter on family life and reflects a lot on the experiences of women in mining communities as disabled people, and is also still often the case today, disabled people who are caring for other disabled people. I think if you are interested in that sort of history, you know, the one area where it is quite overlapping is around mental health history and particularly I would say it usually middle class women's experience of, of mental health um, care and treatment um, as kind of an overlapping area where disability is very very much the the focus through a, through a lens of both feminist history but also kind of the, the male gaze as a historical analysis and there is some really good stuff about that. And I just, I'll just quickly follow on from um, from from that point um, as well. And um, just going deeper into well, and David's point, I should say. Um, Warren has a question. He's um, he says that he's a, a full time wheelchair user who is also a teacher and a social worker, and he finds it. Um, I hope you don't mind me saying this. Frustrating that disability history and disability issues don't get the um, the same level of seriousness as other forms of societal oppression. What can and could be done to um, rectify this? I guess it's a question for both of you. Um, Amy, do you want to go first on this? Sure. I mean, I think more events like this is great. Um, <laughs> and I think that it speaks, you know, what we were talking about at the, at the beginning of the session is that disabled people, it, it feels like from a lot of historians' perspectives, we were inv invented in the 1960s, unless we were soldiers. Um, so I think there needs to be a bit of a bit of a turn, as, as the historians say. We need a disability turn. Um, and I think that there are lots of excellent disabled historians. 
I think more public disability history is needed and it is coming in there and I know Greg Jenner is part of the program and is a really big champion for for popular disability histories and his books feature disabled people who on who have disabilities and he highlights it and says you know this bit is often written written out as if it's an irrelevant part of their experience so I think that's the thing people especially you know lots of lots of more popular histories there's still that level of discomfort around talking about disability as it being part of a lived experience and I think that's really you know that's the kind of attitude we still have to break down like it's not an indecent thing to mention that Josephine Baker was a disabled person you know yeah I don't think I'd add much more to that really I think <laughs> you know teaching more disability history in schools is, is really important I think and uh you know um I'm really interested in what happens when you look at big topics like the Industrial Revolution from the perspective of people who are normally marginalised from that story. And I think you can, there's some really interesting stories to tell about, not just about disabled people's lives, but looking at big events from a disability perspective brings something new to our understanding of that. So, um, you know, more of it, yeah. <laughs> Um, another another question that's that's popped up a couple of times, so, and I'm afraid the um, the original poster of this question has gone. The, the, it's scrolled up, so I can't name check, but I can name check Anne, who's asked a similar question, um, which is about um, whether we have any information or histories of people with develop developmental disabilities um, in in the historical record, and and if we do, what does that say? Um, you know, what does that tell us? Um, Anne says that she's an autistic person and particularly interested in this. I mean, there's there's quite a lot from the census because, and this is when I was talking about language before, and it's something that I have to educate a lot of people on social media, is words like idiot and imbecile, they were medical categories. Like that that was your your condition. And these were often words used for people with with cognitive disabilities. So I would say from, there's a lot of this kind of classic institutional histories of those experiences, both from the perspective of the workhouse and poverty, but again, also from certainly my expertise around um, mental health and the, you know, the more middle-class experience being a little bit more genteel um, if you had a, had a condition that would usually be, you know, interpreted as some, especially in women would be interpreted as, you know, a uterine condition gone wrong. Um, I don't know if you've got any more thoughts on that, David. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a big topic to answer in a, in a minute or so, but um, I know someone just uh, put a message in the chat a moment ago about asking for recommendations for reading. And what I'd, a book I'd really recommend if you're, if you're interested in, in this is a fantastic book which came out last year by Simon Jarrett. Um, on the history of learning disability from the 18th century to the present, and, um, and, and you know, Simon describes a you know, world in the 18th century where, the, where people with developmental disabilities were very, very much included in part mm. in society, um, but but they become disproportionately institutionalised as the 19th century goes on. Institutionalisation is not a universal experience for disabled people, but if you if you have um, a developmental disability, then the, the, then your chance of being institutionalised are much greater, and you know that's another example of um, differential treatment of, of disabled people in the past. And this is where, as a former post-colonial historian, I could wax lyrical about categories of otherness in the 19th century and how statistics and data are used to other people. And that's why a lot of the histories of disability are institutional because those Victorian bureaucrats loved a record. And that's, you know, unfortunately where a lot of that lived experience that the majority of the historical record that has been previously examined, that's where people have gone for it. Um, I, we obviously are running a little bit um, short on time now, but we do have a little, we do have enough time to ask a couple more questions, but I'll start by an anecdote that's been given um, from Kate. Um, she says that um, referring to disabled people teaching um, on um, in Northeast Shropshire, my great, great, aunt was born without arms and taught in the 1860s she could also sweep floors and bring in coal buckets um which is a, a lovely story to have in your family history and um, I, I want to go to a question that's been raised by a couple of people about reading material specifically for school age children are, are there is there anything that you could recommend i'm putting you on the spot now Ooh. 
or any case studies that might be good to um to look at that can um make you know perhaps if there's any young people that um, might be interesting case studies for um school age children um that's my, really, my yeah, favorite um, and I, it's a little bit later and she is quite well known but i think she's a really good example is um rosa may billinghurst who's known as the crippled suffragette um i think it's great because quite often you know suffragettes are already in the curriculum and with disability history I think where possible where you make it part of the experience and not this kind of siloed off unique we're going to look at disabled people now like where you go oh look there you know there's this movement of women and one of them used to use her wheelchair to ram the police like which I just think I mean obviously I'm not encouraging children towards civil disobedience but um, you know it's an interesting example to reflect on of a disabled person being actively involved in uh, in a protest movement which is not something that we get a lot of history of so she, she's my favorite example for children and <laughs> um, so I, I've, I've got another question um, here from um, Sam and um, they ask what what do you see as underexplored topics in the field of disability history or ideas that should have more focus uh... Ooh, that's again, another big question. Um, well, I mean, I think, I think, yeah, as we said a moment ago, I think, I think, um, I, I think we need more intersectional disability histories, really, about sort of how disability um, connects with race and gender, um, sexuality, and so on. I think, I think the um, the, most, the most interesting work is at that interface. Um, uh, both in sort of in modern activism, I think, and in uh, and in historical work as well. So, so, so we need we need a more diverse disability history because it is you know it does tend to focus on white Western people, and I think that um, and so more disability histories um, of um, of the global South and more intersectional histories, I think, would be really really um, useful. And also, um, I think more. Um, more history that look into these kind of hidden experiences such as chronic illness and chronic, chronic pain, which is an area I'm particularly interested in at the moment and how people sort of experience disability over time um, through sort of their individual biographies. I think that those are kind of areas that uh, I think are really valuable to explore a bit more. I think for me, there's kind of two areas I'd like to see more of. So the first is, kind of creative and artistic histories of disability beyond the kind of freak show focus because you know disabled people created art and music and culture and too often that lens is you know restricted to how disabled people were the subjects of the gaze and I'd like to see more about the work that they produce um, because as ever kind of creative spaces are often refuges for disabled people who live more unconventional lives I think from, from a modern perspective as an activist and as a lapsed historian, and this is something David and I are reflecting on, is um, we'd love to see more modern oral histories of disability mm -hmm. and that really kind of grassroots movement around collecting those histories of the lived experience, the stuff that is really missing quite often from the historical record. And there's a great project in America called Disvisibility, um, and that is creating a huge archive of those lived experiences. And I think that's something that perhaps we might need to work on in the UK. And, uh, you know, maybe if we can get our uh, thinking caps on, <laughs> we can make it happen. Um, just because uh, we do have a, a few minutes left, just to go back to the Industrial Revolution, we had a question um, very early on, actually, that um, for David, um, do you have any idea about the percentage of the population during this time, or that time, I should say, that had a disability as um, compared with today? That's, yeah, <laughs> I wish I did, is the answer, as a short answer to that question, because it's very difficult to to, to determine that. Um, so today, um, just um, between about a fifth and a, uh, and a quarter of people, have, um, are, this is working age adults, uh, are disabled, uh, some variations around the country. Um, it's very difficult to say that for the 19th century, because partly because um, although we have the census as a source, um, disability isn't recorded in the census or, or you know, uh, for the earlier periods, you start to get sensory impairments and 
uh, and sort of um, and so, so called idiocy being re um, recorded in the census as time goes on. But but even that, you know, is it's, it's limited in terms of what we can uh, use. Um, it's difficult, to, you know, even for you know some of the kids' industrial accidents to get um, reliable figures about how many people. Um, are injured because there's um, controversy about what actually is a serious accident. Um, coal mine owners were very reluctant to report these things, even even when they were compelled to by law. And you know, any and accidents don't equal disability. So it is really, really difficult to to do that. Um, you know, so we're reliant on more kind of uh, anecdotal. Accounts, but what I would say actually is in the 1830s when people were um, were using disability as kind of evidence for the need to uh, reduce the hours of labour of young children in factories. There are um, act, uh, sort of labour activists creating their own censuses of disabled people. So there's a there's the Macclesfield Cripple Census, um, which is not very well known, but uh, but someone actually went round the streets in Macclesfield and counted the number of of uh, so-called cripples in, in, in his community, which you can then sort of pre pre present as, uh, as quantitative evidence of um, how dangerous uh, silk mills were uh, in, in, in that period. So, so that, that's also very interesting, but, but not enough to really answer that, that question. Um, well, we are, I'm afraid, out of time. There are still lots of questions, but if you'd like to continue the conversation on social media afterwards, that's... Um, you know, please do, please do so. Amy and David are both on social media, on Twitter. Um, and I'm sure, well, I'm being a bit cheeky here, but I'm sure they, they wouldn't mind asking <laughs> questions, she says. Um, but yeah, use the hashtag HistFest2021 um, and I'm sure we'll find those questions there. But that just leaves me to say a huge thank you to David and to Amy for holding such a, a wonderful conversation and um, kicking off HistFest2021 weekend. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. It's been an absolute pleasure. I can't tell if we're live still. So <laughs> just going to put that out there. If we are, then hi, everyone still. Um, I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to let everyone see uh, Guide Dog Ava if we are still live. There she is. There we go. Napping away. <laughs> oh, we've changed. We've changed. Um, oh, how old is she? She is nearly three. Did you get her as a puppy or? No, oh. so I got her in November. Oh gosh. And do, does she, do, how long does the training take? Um, so her training took two years. Oh. And then our training together took uh, seven weeks. Oh, does that, so what do they have like a place where all, all the dogs train? This is just like the sweetest thing ever. <laughs> so, yeah. So Ava's life, she spent the first two years of her life with a puppy raising family. Um, and they taught her how to be a good girl. And uh, then she went to big school and she learned how to be a very good girl. And then there's kind of that's about a year. And then there's a sort of final uh, portion where they give them kind of all the big tests about, you know, do they understand what a car is and oh. they walk their person into a hole um, and then they come and then you get matched and then you train together. So yeah, she, two, two years. What's the, what, if you don't mind my asking, what's the bond like between the pair of you? Because obviously you, you have a different relationship to um, what would be a typical pet owner relationship. Is yeah. it, do you feel really like deeply connected to her? Oh, absolutely. Like even like she's, I've only been with her since November and she's made a huge difference. Like she's big personality. She's very intuitive. She's very good at mental health stuff. If I'm having a bad mental health day. She likes to come and sit on me. Um, she just sits on my chest if I'm lying down or like she'll just come and sit on me to be like don't worry everything's fine but she's quite sassy Ava um, she uh, she has a stink eye we say and quite often um, when she has to make a decision so guide dogs are the only dogs that are um, trained to disobey their owner and um, she has to use her judgment when she disobeys me and so 
for example, if I tell her to take us across a road and she can see that there's a car coming, she'll ignore me. And my other half says when she does that, she then sort of looks up at me like, uh, what? Didn't you? Mom, there's a car there. You're such an idiot. <laughs> oh, um, I'm being I'm being informed that we, we need to wrap up now um, by the powers <laughs> that be. So um, I, I could talk about the sweet little dog forever, but I'm afraid we're, we're going to have to leave. But if people are still with us, just another thank you for uh, for joining. And again, thank you to David and Amy. Um, and that is it. We are going. Goodbye. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye.